Hello, everyone. Welcome to a disturbing episode of ARG Presents. I'm Amigo Aaron, joined by a man who runs on an operating system so old, you can install it with one punch card. I give you the Brent. My, my, oh. That's it? That's right. That's my operating system. Oh. Clearly, he's already crashed. What the, what the hell's wrong with you, pal? Good God almighty. So, if you, I'm just going to ignore him. If you joined us last week, we spun the wheel. We made the intimidating deal, frankly. What? You, it was intimidating. This was an intimidating? Intimidating deal. This was the and, one week I was like, ah, easy. And then no. you blew it for us. This week... We're playing Wingo, Windows 3.1 games, folks. Windows 3.x, if you will. I went with 3.1 because anything below that, you're in deep trouble, Brent. Well, you can go to 3.11 and get all that fancy network support. And we're going to come back to Windows in a minute. But now on a more pleasant subject. A very special segment I like to call Not Windows. Oh, I so, like this segment. So this week, I'm stumbling through a, 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 a resale shop that sells electronics and gaming. And that came across something that we actually featured once in a show. It was actually the Thanks for Giving Marathon uh, Part 2, I believe. I'm going to reach over and grab this right now. Brent hasn't seen this, but it was something I had to pick up. Oh, I hope it's a Sam Coupe. It's not a Sam Coupe. In fact, it's nowhere near that cool. (laughs) However, it is unusual. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can get out of the bag. You might hear some struggling. That's me struggling. I present to you the Socrates. Oh my gosh! Hold that up. It's a Socrates. It also has the touchpad. <laughs> Hold on, I'm not done yet. You can't have a Socrates without the keyboard. This this it might on there. this might be your dumbest purchase ever. Oh no, <laughs> it gets far dumber. We also have... Oh, couple, check that. It's a perfect fit. It's almost like it's made for it. It also came with a couple games here. We got... I'm sorry we didn't get the state game you like. Oh. We, we did get Facts and Fractions. Ooh. Facts and Fractions. And one that Brent can work on. Memory Mania. What's that first one again? Facts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, this thing also has... I don't know if you mentioned this. Of course, you got the touchpad here. You gotta have the light pen, oh, or whatever this thing is. I paid too much for this, folks, I'll be honest with you, but it was such a stunning, I was literally leaving the store when I saw it, I was like, holy crap, something we covered that's not like a Genesis or something. (laughs) This thing, if you look in the back, Brent, tell the people, I'll hold the keyboard. I got it. Open that battery pack and see, look in that cavernous space. This is one of the few consoles we covered that actually works on batteries. Oh, it looks like a big old 6C batteries. 6C batteries on that one. So, we may do a little play on this at some point in the future. I, I, I've been told it works. In fact, the owner of the place I was at, this was his Socrates from when he was three. It is in, it's incredibly clean. It's incredibly yeah. uh, uh, well-maintained. Yeah. Very few scratch and, and scrapes on it. Yeah. Uh, These go regular on eBay for, I mean, a, the complete thing was against around 70 bucks. So we're paid a little bit. But I didn't have to have it shipped. And I got a couple cool games with it. I like the fact that the games in the back, they're made to look like floppy disks for <laughs> some reason. And on the front, too. See? That's kind of neat. Man, let's just cover this again. Nope, probably oh. not. So, but we never fully covered that one, so maybe that one could come back. That's true. That's true. We could make a wheel piece for it. So anyway, there you go. There's hey, the... if we make a wheel piece for it, I know what games we're playing. Yeah, no kidding. The Socrates, Brandon. What do you think? They didn't expect that, did you? I did not. I did not. Now, <laughs> you're right. That's certainly not as cool <clears throat> as, say, a, a Sam Coupe. Yeah. But that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I approve. So there you go. Socrates. We'll get back into that one of these days. But now, hold on, we're going back. Here we are. <laughs> Where was I? So let's talk about, you know, I didn't want to spend this time going into the history of Windows or any crap like that. No one cares, right? Let's talk about the... But this has a rich, treasured history. No, it doesn't. Oh. Let's talk about the atmosphere of gaming when Windows came around. Okay. Right? Now, Windows was around for quite a while. It's previous incarnations of Windows, Windows 2, you know, whatever. The older windows. No one talks no about No one talks about those, no. Uh, and I looked at these windows, 
back in the day, and I thought they were garbage. And I was a DOS guy. I didn't give a crap about them. Sure. And, and no games would run on these things. They were crap. So here comes Windows 3, okay? And, and this was the first time that I had to actually install Windows because I wanted to do stuff in it. Yeah. And it was reluctant. I operated in Windows for as minimal amount of time as I could. Yeah. Because I didn't like it. It was still clunky, uh, pointless. It slowed your computer down. That was the biggest it problem. It was a load. <clears throat> that know? was the biggest problem. Now, do you remember... Yeah, you're a little younger than me. Do you remember much about Windows 3.11 or 3? Uh, I actually did the exact same thing you did, mainly because I didn't have a choice. Uh, Windows 95 was the first Windows I installed myself and had my own little deal with. But 3.11... Uh, it like you said, it just was sitting on top of DOS, and at that point, why not just use DOS? Right, right. So, and, and I already knew all the commands for DOS, and I knew how to navigate DOS. I knew how to get to where I was doing and play what I wanted to play through DOS. Yeah. So for me, Windows was just like, oh, I don't have enough memory because I'm in Windows. Why am I doing this? Right. This sucks. Uh, but all that said, uh. Uh, Windows 3.11 was a huge leap above its previous uh, incarnations, especially when you consider like the uh, some of the network features. And it was the beginning of of uh, you know this was this is when plug and play was plug and pray because you would still have to go and do your driver thing and all that good jazz, but it made it a lot simpler to install some of that stuff. Uh, I hated it, and I'll tell you why. I didn't like it either, now, but it was still I, it You was were still right about important. plug and pray, because Windows, setting stuff up under 3.11, and, and and for that matter, even up to Windows 95, and even a little bit of 98 was a, was a hassle. Well, I'm sorry, that's Microsoft calling me right now. Uh, <laughs> they're sick of your crap, and they're gonna let you know about it. Oh, God. Anyways, so, I didn't like the fact that when you know when you run DOS, you, especially back in the old days, you had to be very specific to what uh, what programs you were running in the background. Yeah, and you could control memory management perfectly. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you inst- when you first tip your toe in the pool that is Windows three eleven or three, you can't tell everything that's coming up in the background. This sounds sort of pedestrian now. It was a big deal back then. Memory management was sort of an art form yes. at the time. Yeah. And it became more important up through you know, into the and before before Windows XP, where it sort of that changed everything. Well, yeah, you know, the, the XP was uh, uh, as far above Windows 3.11 as uh, it was above DOS. Yeah. So now, I mean, I'll, I'll admit mm-hmm. that by the time Windows 95 came around, they, that was the big jump, in my opinion. Yeah, it was Windows 90 or Windows 3.11. I mean, it was a jump, but it was. Yeah, I mean, it, was. it really wasn't. I didn't think it was really worth that much. Now. If you're someone using a lot of uh, word processors and stuff like that, maybe that helped for, for that. But business, I, yeah. For gaming or for BBS, and I didn't give a crap, you know. So I never used it, and I sure as heck didn't game with it. However, there were games specifically made for this system, or you know, more or less specifically. I printed out a little list here of just Windows three games. Now we're going to go over all this thing. It's pretty big. They, well, these are games that would run on Windows 3.11, not that were specifically made for the system. Because the games right. specifically made for the system that would only run on Windows 3.11 is like six. It's a very, very small amount. Well, I mean, let's talk about what were the games that everyone played on Windows? Like Minesweeper, that, Solitaire. Yeah, I don't count those. Those count. Those were the most popular games by far. So, yeah, they were. And I can tell you, um, everything else, if you could get the DOS version, you played that. Yeah. Now, uh, since we're talking about Solitaire and whatnot, yeah. you, and I'm sure you know the answer to this, but for the people out there that might not know, yeah. do you know why Solitaire was included in Windows 3.11? I don't. Uh, it was to get people, it was a familiar game to get people used to using a mouse. Huh? No kidding. Yep, that makes sense. I never. Because it had the that. click and drag mechanics and all that stuff. That's what it was for. So I'm look. I look over this list, and just, I said, just glancing over it, and a lot of the stuff on here is stuff that is long gone. Probably, basically, mostly stuff that was based specifically for the Windows. 
You know, you had games that ran in a native Windows window. Yeah. And so those games use the uh, environment of Windows to play stuff. Stuff like, like I said, Minesweeper, the little golf games, little pinball games, stuff like that. Uh, you also had games that were of a, a larger variety, stuff like a battle chess, something like that. But these games had multiple versions, and they also, again, in my experience, Windows 3 just slowed them down so much, they didn't make them fun to play. Plus, you had to find drivers for Windows. That stuff was foreign at the time, you sure. know what I mean? So, it was tough. Now... I'm losing my voice rapidly, so we're going to kick right in. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed you're going downhill. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to start Brent off today. We're gonna, no, no, you're starting No, we're off. starting you off today so I can recover my voice. Because <laughs> <laughs> clearly I'm running out of steam. This is what happens when you talk nonstop for weeks. So, Brent, t- tell us about out of the, all the games that you could have picked this week, which one did you pick into? I took a Windows 3.x exclusive <laughs> exclusive. This was the only way to play this game at the time. Yeah. And I picked Castles of the Winds. Now, I, I'd say I never heard of this, to be honest with you. I never heard great of it. Great title. It, it is a great title. But when I started to research this, like everyone had heard of it and was talking about yes. it. Yes. So I knew you were on to something. Yeah. I, 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 I also had never played this before. Um, this is a game that was uh, developed by Rick Seda. And it was published by Epic Mega Games. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> they did a lot of great yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, re- re- the release for this was 1989. Uh, so, you know, pretty far back there. And let me talk a little bit about Rick uh, a- as a developer. This guy played the old school TRS-80 games. Uh, grew up in the 70s playing that kind of stuff. And he, he played a couple games and said, you know what, I want to make one of these. And his very first game was a text adventure that couldn't even be saved to disc or anything. It, he had it on a school computer, and he loaded it up, and some of his buddies played it, and they liked it. It was, uh, you know, so that kind of got the ball rolling. So he learned how to program and learned the ins and outs of computers at the time, and eventually said, you know what, uh, uh I need to, I need to go to school, and he applied to Harvard and MIT and a couple of these huge schools. And he said, "In case I don't get these, so you know that you kind of know he's a smart dude." He says, "In case I don't get these, I'm going to go ahead and apply for a couple jobs uh, and see what happens." And all his buddies were working for Microsoft, so he decided to also apply for Microsoft. And Lo and behold, Microsoft called him back and said, you know what, fly out to Seattle. We'd like to see what you can do. Uh, We're thinking about giving you a job. So he went out there and applied, and all the colleges he applied for denied him. Said, you know, you're not good enough for us. (laughs) But Microsoft was like, yes, come on board. So he just, he skipped college and went straight to Microsoft. And when he got to Microsoft, he wasn't working on Windows stuff. He was working on DOS stuff. He was actually working on uh, Word for DOS. So he's in this group, and he's having fun. He's enjoying it. He said that the environment uh, of Microsoft at that time was very small groups. You know, people just having fun. You were family with your groups. And, you know, it was there were perks to working with Microsoft. It wasn't, you know, just a daily grind. <coughs> But he saw the writing on the wall. He said as soon as he saw the the Windows 2 releases, he was like, this is the future. And if I don't get into this now, I, 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 it's going to leave me behind. So he actually... A man of vision. Yeah. He, he saw he, Windows 2 and thought that. He actually started programming uh, in his spare time to learn Windows, to learn how to program in Windows. And to do that... He went back to some of his favorite games that he played in the past, which were roguelikes, and, uh, or Rogue, actually, was one he credited a lot, <coughs> and said, I'm going to try to make this for Windows, inside of Windows. And that's what he did, and, he came, and we came up with Castles of the Wind. Uh, and when he made this, 
I mean, in the beginning, it was, I'm going to learn how to program on Windows, so I'm going to make this game. And then the game started getting some popularity, and they said, you know what, you know, you need to do this proper. So he got an artist uh, by the name he of... He did? Yeah, Paul, <laughs> wow. Paul Caniff, okay. who did uh, all the art for the box of the game and everything else. And he was going to self-publish this game. Yeah. And he was going to go with the shareware route, which is why this game has uh, chapters. Yeah. And he decided <coughs> at the last minute, uh, Tim Sweeney said, you know what, don't do that, and convinced him for to be released with a publisher. And he's actually, uh, Rick was glad he did that. Because not only did he meet some people in the industry, which helped him later down the line with some of the games he put out, but it also allowed him to sell more copies than he probably would have sold uh, otherwise. Now, how many copies do you think this game sold, Aaron, back in the day? Jeez, you know, it's funny you're saying this story, because number one, I knew there was a demo of this, and I also knew it was released in chapters, so I actually didn't know they boxed it until I actually found the box. Yes. And so to guess the amount of copies, let's say, I don't know, 10,000. I believe uh, that the estimated registra registered copies was 13,500. And that was a that was huge close. boon for him. That yeah. was a that was a huge selling game for the time uh, for yeah, such a for limited yeah. yeah, such a limited platform. So Rick actually didn't do much else with gaming uh, past that until uh, in the late 2000s, 2008, his buddies called him back and, uh, I'm sorry, 2001, his buddies called him back and said, look, we're having trouble getting this rail game out the door, come and help us program for it, and that was Rails Across America. Oh, yeah, I heard of that. And then later on the line, his other game that he's uh, credited for is an MMO called Pirates of the Burning Sea. So those are the three games that he you know, has major credits on. So he didn't do a lot for the gaming industry, uh, but Castles of the Wind is something that is very fondly remembered. And it's kind of funny, it's very old school how he got to where he was going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, now, so wasn't there like a sequel, or was that another chapter? That the Castles of the Wind, it was multiple chapters, and yeah. some people have it as Castles of the Wind 2. Yeah. Uh, but it's really just... But it's all the, him. The chapters. He did all... Yeah. The, okay, yeah. I got you. <laughs> now... Uh, something else he did that was unheard of at the time was he retained all the selling rights for his game. Okay. No, no developer had, you know, when you get a publisher, uh, you usually just sell your life away. But he actually retained those rights. And uh, later in his years, uh, he, he said, you know what? I'm just going to give this game away. And he released it free to the public. I believe that was in 93, but I could be wrong about that, uh, and just gave it away. So you can go and legally get a copy of Castles of the Wind right now, play it, enjoy it, and know that you have the developer's blessing. You can play it online. Yeah. Right. I think castlesofthewind.com or something like that, and you can go play it. I played it on archive.org, yeah. but uh, uh, yeah, it's totally free. It's totally public domain. So, what is Castles of the Wind? Why would you want to go and play this game? Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a roguelike game that uses the numpad for movement. You've got your eight directions for movement, and it is very uh, RPG story-based, which rogue is not. Uh, <coughs> you go, and you start in this little humble town, and you can go into the shops and spend your... You have a little bit of money, and then you go to the next screen, and the screen's on the scroll, uh, but usually up to a point. There's okay. usually a point where there is a transition. Yeah. So you scroll to your next screen, and you're kind of wandering around, and you find this old burned-out house, and you walk up to it, and you find out that's your old childhood, that's your old house, that's where you live, and your parents are dead, and... It has a note, you know, it's like, you have to go and find this item. It's like your birthright. And your character gets all pissed off and goes charging into the mountain. And that's where the game begins proper. And you have to go and recover the item and then find out who killed your parents and go hunt them down for vengeance. It's funny, I didn't know any of that. I just went right, <laughs> I just went right to the mountain and didn't do any of the, and didn't go to the burnout house. I knew any of that stuff. So I just thought you just wandered around like an idiot. I was learning on the fly. Yep. So... 
uh, the game plays as your standard rogue. You run into things that you want to fight. Things on the ground you can pick up and put in your inventory. Uh, it has inventory slots for your your back and your head and your waist. There are tons of inventory slots, and you can pick up enchanted armor and uh, you know improved weaponry. This reminded me of like the way you, they sort of did an EQ, where you had all the slots for your wrists and your back and everything, and you can just, and this you can just slide them in. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that, this was that was surprising actually. And it, this does take advantage of the Windows interface because it you use. Uh, you play in a window, so you to get to your inventory or something, you click on the inventory tab and it br drops down a menu. Yeah, and it does all that stuff just like you would expect a Windows-based game to do. <coughs> and you can even pick up. Uh, did you pick up any cursed items? No, no. Yeah, you can pick up cursed items that hurt you, and you, you can't take them off, and you're kind of stuck with them. So everything is a, a bit of a risk. Yeah. Uh, the environments in this have lighting. Uh, anytime you walk into a room, uh, if it's if the ground is blue, which I thought was ice for a long time, but if the ground is blue, that means the room is lit because most of the hallways you go down are not lit, and you can only see you know a, one tile ahead of you. Yeah. But when you go into these lit rooms, you can see the whole room as soon as you walk in. When you move, something that's kind of a technical marvel about this, because this is a, a you move the enemies move type of game. Yeah. When you move, all the enemies that are off screen move as well. So there might be, you know, 30, 40, 50 enemies in unexplored parts of the map that are also moving around. Now, most of those enemies are stationary. They stay in their room or, they, you know, they stay beside what they're guarding. But there are enemies that will roam that every time you move, they got to take a step as well that are just wandering around. <clears throat> the enemies in this game are your standard goblins, orcs, you know, dogs, rats, spiders, that kind of stuff. Uh, but they have a bit of intelligence with them. They don't react to your character unless they actually see your character. So you can walk up behind some of them, um, and they will chase you down, but they are also smart enough not to go too far. They won't chase you endlessly. At least none, the most of the mobs I found didn't do that. They kind of stayed to where they were supposed to be. The map on this thing is immense with going up and down stairs, plenty of doors to go in uh, as you explore the castle, tons of equipment to find. You can always take the money that you found, leave, go back to the town, buy potions and stuff, Armor. <clears throat> spells. You get uh, uh, spells as you level up. You have stats in the game. You have strength and intelligence and uh, constitution. Very D&D-like, which he also said that he yeah. was uh, interested in at the time. Fun game. Aaron, what did you think about this? Well, <clears throat> this is, a, you know, to look at this game, you're like, look at it. You're looking at this thing. You're like, man, this looks like, this is some jakey looking stuff. But this is actually a pretty cunningly designed game. Yes. The, uh, if you're a D&D player, you were instantly... I could always tell what a guy played, and this guy was a clear player. But, th but they used... Hey, this is a game that actually used Windows to suck less. It's yep. a miracle. He actually did a good job. I like the inventory. I like the... It reminds me, if you ever played uh, on the Amiga, there's a game called Deja Vu. It lets you drag and drop stuff into your inventory. So this is similar... There are similar game mechanics in terms of the interfaces for it, which I like. Um, the spells are good. It's got a spell uh, shortcut bar, yeah. which is great. You can store 10, ten spells there without having to go through the window to yep. get your spells. Uh, you can doctor your guy to be a, a spell slinger or a fighter. You know, because at the beginning you adjust the points. Yep. Um, <clears throat> it's drop dead simple. You move with a numpad, and when you want to fight something, you just run into it. Yep. Or it runs into you, you know. Um, I was surprised, frankly. I mean, it ain't pretty, but if you're talking about roguelike games, this is like the top shelf of those. In terms, I mean, in terms of the beauty and simplicity of it, and to tell what's going on, I thought it was quite remarkable, to be completely honest with you. Now, this game has two major failings. All right. <clears throat> Uh, major failing number one is when you pick up and equip things, uh, 
your stats change, but nothing graphically changes. No. Well, your guy's tiny. He's not that tiny. He's the size of a, of a Windows icon. <clears throat> the second and far more uh, outrageous <clears throat> thing, no audio. Yeah, this no game audio. has zero audio. Um, I don't know if that was the limitation of Rick's ability, or if he, you know, didn't find it to be important. But the game has zero audio, which was a bit of a turnoff for me. I like the fact that the, I like the menu where you can like search, pick. A, there's a instead of a type. This this you know, me and Boat just covered a game called Ultima 5 on the Amigos, okay? Uh-huh. Great game. And Boat, and uh, we talked seven. about that how that game had a foot in two worlds. It had a foot in the, in the text-based world, and yes. it had a foot in the graphics-based world. This game takes the foot out of the, gra- of the text-based world, and it's all done with menus. Yeah. This is so much easier. Yeah. So much more... I would love to have the Ultima storyline stuck into this. It would be awesome. Yeah. Because this is a much simpler interface. And it's a powerful interface. I remember, I was surprised. You know, I don't like something that's overcomplicated. I don't have to deal with a party of players. I, don't, I hate that crap. This game is my kind of game. Yeah. Simple, you know, the roguelikes. I can deal with those. So, I, I mean, when I loaded this up, I was like, this looks like, I don't like it. I was wrong. Not bad at all. Yeah. Not bad. Uh, two things this thing really had going for it at the time. Uh, its its setting was Norse. Mm. Uh, it uses uh, a, a lot of Norse gods and Norse terminology, um, which played up a little bit now. But back in the time, back in the day, that was uh, fresh. That was kind of new. Um, thing number two that we, we've already mentioned. This is all controlled with a mouse and a numpad, and it is <coughs> it makes Excuse the me. experiment or the uh, experience very seamless. Now you can still uh, you know do things that you would think only a text adventure would do. Yeah, uh, ver menu, but with a point and click. Yeah. So <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's my favorite part. Listen, t- I, I have a romantic touch for. I like. Zork and Oscar, but I mean, I don't want to play them now. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. Yeah. I want something more modern. If you want to play something that feels old, I mean, does this have the atmosphere of those? No. Oh no. But no, what it no. does have, if you want to run, if this is like, if you just want to rumble through a a, a, a module or something and just crush everything and have a good time, this is the game for you. Oh, although yeah. you will die. Also, this oh, yeah. does have a save feature. Yeah. So you can pick it up, play for a little bit, and put it back down. Uh. On eBay, Aaron, how much do you think this sells for, the boxed version? I don't know, 10 bucks? Uh, the last one sold, shipped for $20. Not bad. Uh, and that was I'm on fire. sealed. <clears throat> or, 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 I give this game my go emulate it seal of approval. Uh, it's easy. You can go to uh, abandon, uh, archive.org, load it right up, be playing in five minutes, understand it, enjoy it, have a good time. I give it my go to like uh, castlewinds.com or Google it, and you don't have to do any of that stuff. Well, it's the same basic bear, <laughs> homie. There you go. I, I, I was I was pretty pretty surprised about this one. I'll be honest with you. Good call. Now let's go on to your game. You have to help me out on this. I'm gonna do the best I can. I do apologize, guys, for my voice. So when we decided to when we decided to. Uh, uh, what games to play. Brent gave me a little bit of leeway with this one. It's not a Windows 3 exclusive, uh, but it did debut on Windows 3 on the on the, on the the PC platform. So we're going to give it a pass. And it's funny. It, Who would have thunk it, by the way? I, I had no idea. I didn't either. To be honest with you, because, well, I'll get to that in a second. Let me have a drink here. The game I chose uh, this time around was Mist. Mist, y'all. Now, everyone's probably heard of Mist. You know, um, but it's got a, quite a story. It does have quite a story. Yeah. That's true. Um, this came out, uh, this was released in 93, and it sh- it sort of hit our shores in early 94. So this is a late release. All right. Of course, this got released for everything, right? Eventually, yeah. The 3DO, the CDI, the iPhone, 
The Jag. Got a copy of this? Sure, why not? The Mac, which was the lead you know, yep. platform. The Playstations. All those. The Saturn. Windows Mobile. They even got supported. So, why did we choose this? Well... <laughs> Well, I chose oh, it. Oh, you. Why I did you chose choose it that? because it was something that you wouldn't have expected. Let me tell you a little story as best uh, as I can. I remember when the first CD-ROMs came around, okay, on the PC. All right? They were one speed, y'all. They weren't no good. They were a hassle to get running. Yeah. Right? And I don't remember anyone having one on Windows 3. No. I don't. I remember people having them on Windows 95. 95, yeah. They were uh, expensive. Yeah. All right. They were uh, tough to set up. You know what you're doing. Inherently, most PCs did not have a SCSI adapter that you would require for most of the early CD-ROMs. Eventually, sound cards would accommodate you on that. Yes. And then eventually, of course, they would become IDE CD-ROMs. They would get faster. But this is the early days. Expensive. Discs for these things, if you, you didn't know what had a writer, and oh, the readers no. were un, unusual. I, now, not back in these days. When you think er, the earliest, the earliest CD-ROM titles, what are the ones you think of? Just give me a reel off a couple. Uh, I, the earliest game I can even think of that I had on CD was uh, MechWarrior 2. Oh, way back before that. I, I'm just saying, that's the earliest one I vividly remember. The earliest remember. ones I remember was, was a game called The Seventh Guest. Okay. okay. The seventh guest was this multimedia puzzle game. Okay. And it was quite a uh, crowd pleaser because it had digitized graphics and, and audio and uh, full movie. motion video. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, you move, flash forward because the seventh guest actually plays into the development of this game. Okay. It's kind of neat. So. This game was designed by a couple guys called Robin and Rand Miller, brothers. There's some great documentary footage out there on the making of this game. So, these guys developed games on the Mac, right, using this specific software that was, that was, that was pretty, you know, pretty powerful stuff. And so, it was called HyperCard. And they developed these sort of rudimentary kids games with it. And, and they did okay. And so... Sunsoft from Japan saw what they were doing and said, listen, can you make us something that's a little more adult-oriented? All right. And they said, yeah, we're going to try something. And so they began to develop Myst. And one of the brothers is like an artist. One of them is more of a programmer. And they got together and managed to create this world uh, that would fit on a disc. That was the hardest thing. They had all kinds of high definition images. Yep. You know, and they only had so much room to fit that music. <clears throat> they talk about how that when they were putting the disc together, they had to literally lay the data in certain parts of the disc because they were afraid the one X read would slow down so much that the music would stop. <laughs> right? Pretty heady stuff, right? Back in the day. So eventually. Mist came out on the Mac, and then eventually migrated its way over to PC. Now, let's talk about setting up a, a Windows 3.11 PC for a CD-ROM. I don't recommend it. Hard. Pain in the butt. I hated it. Just setting up DOSBox was a nightmare. Yeah. We had a video that explained how to do this point by point, and it was almost impossible, wasn't it? You tried it, didn't you? Yeah, it, the... The issue with it is more, uh, you know, Windows doesn't want to do this. <laughs> so you have to kind of make Windows do it. You have, you have to add that drive and get all that stuff to, to work together. When, uh, uh, I'm not saying Windows 3.11 couldn't do it, because obviously it could, but it didn't want to do it. You had to force it with your will. Yeah. So these guys were very persistent, and they completed this game over several years. Uh, of work uh, with a team, you know, and they would shoot each other the data back and forth. I didn't really like I said it was a real struggle, but they finished it up. And when they released this game, it's funny. One of the developers, I think it was Rob, and 
said he hoped he went to a, a, a gaming store in San Francisco and he hoped he's like, man, I wonder if my game is on the shelf. And he walked in and he knew he had something when the whole shelf was his game. Yep. Nothing else. <laughs> uh, this game, in case you live in a, in, a, in a closet somewhere, this was the highest selling game of all time until yep. 2002, which is remarkable. Yeah. It spawned a series that continues. It uh, was unbelievable. And as it, as it progressed, uh, the technology improved, and they were able to do a lot more with it. You know, this so the Mist World was an original creation that they expound upon henceforth. Yeah. And so but for 311 and Mac, the early days, you just had Mist. You want to know why this game was so popular? I do. This game was so popular... Because it allowed your uh, your housewives and your businessmen and your uh, your young grandma and grandpa to stick a game into their CD-ROM, and once they got it running, this is something anyone can play because it's not there's no Twitch-based controls. There's no remembering all the commands. It's all uh, it's all very open, and to move around and click to to do the things you're meant to do is all very simple. Yeah. And it opened up an audience that uh, gaming had kind of forgot about because if you weren't playing card games <coughs> or if you weren't playing, uh, you know, the the little uh, slot machine type games, your older audience at the time had nothing to play or a very a limited library. They, they had things, but it was a very limited library. This really opened up and was uh, uh, something any age could sit down and play. I think you nailed it. <clears throat> um, look, when you open this game up, you'll know, when you start the game, it starts with a little, uh, a little intro film of a guy falling. As he's falling, he's talking about what's going to happen to this book. And you end up finding the book, and, that's how the, and you get sucked into the book, the world of mist. And that's how the game begins. Now, you know right away you're in for something nice, because there's odd, the audio in this, the, all, all the uh, musical arrangements. The, this is all a professional job. This was as professional as you could get. They, everything was, and that's one thing these guys didn't skimp. When they made this game, the number one question was, is it going to be like the seventh guest? And they looked at the seventh guest. The seventh guest has got a lot of atmosphere, but it's basically a, you just walk around doing little puzzles. It's a puzzle yeah. game with a really tight wrapper, right? Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't want that. What they wanted was something that immersed you in a world. And so when you play Mist, you're on a screen that is, is not, has nothing on it but the picture. That's it. You have no no interface. There's no interface. No. You can't really die. I mean, you can, but it's you have to rare. really try. <laughs> yeah, you can't really fail. I mean, you could not get it right, but you're not going to be like screwed. Right. There's no point where you can't come back from. And as you explore this world, you are presented these beautiful, high resolution, what well, time, 256 color, beautiful pictures, and you go through them, and you just click through them. And your mouse is all mouse driven, and you'll click on uh, handles, you'll click on doors, buttons, and this stuff will just open. It, it's all pretty intuitive, isn't it? Yeah, stuff that looks interactive is interactive. <clears throat> You're greeted with little little films occasionally uh, if you do the right thing that open up the story to you about this island and the the intrigue that went on. You know who's done what, the technology involved. Where, where are you? Stuff like that. Something else they managed to do. I don't know if you did this, but there are books scattered throughout this game that you can click on and read many pages of. There's a lot of reading in this. Well, that's, that's the thing. thing. If you want to, <clears throat> do we have any game footage of this, Aaron? I do. I uh, do. This is a game that if you want to get super lost in the world, you can get super lost in the world because there is plenty of backstory and lore. Uh, but it, some of it is presented to you in videos, but a large majority of it is presented in text. So it, you, you have the, the, the back, the back stuff. Yeah, the back yeah. story. Yeah, you, you're you right. have to, and you have to be willing to invest your time to really get into this game. And a lot of people did. 
so <coughs> the having all this text and stuff to read was a joy for a, a large portion of the audience that who's playing Mist. This is not a game, like I said, there, this has quite a bit in common with Seventh Gap. And one of the things you'll see uh, in these old CD titles is that they minimize like the 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 uh, video and stuff to like this run on a backbone of QuickTime. And yeah. so you're going to get these little windows. You know, it's sort of the AKA. Uh, um, they they've got the they've got the uh, the little uh, box off so you the window is small because the video sure. can't be accommodated at full screen right like you're saying with CD it, it would look that. like crap if it was full screen so that's they, right they, they put it to a small square and so unlike uh, unlike Seventh Guest the and I'd say this is a puzzle game oh hundred percent but it's but it's not like a it's not like a slide a tile type puzzle game. This is a game where you have to go and l- go around and try to find all the all the uh, different numbers and symbols and whatnot to actually uh, figure out what the what you're supposed to type into certain consoles. Example: one of the first places you go, there's a door on a wall that has some numbers written on it and it, with what they are, and then you open the panel and there's a place to enter numbers. This is the simplest puzzle. When you type in the different number, you get a different thing on the readout and the on the big dais in the middle right. of it, right? Stuff like that. So, it's it, this requires you to explore a huge world. You're not going to run through this game uh, in a couple minutes. It, it's you. You could sit down. <laughs> well, you, how yeah, far you can? How, how far could you get through? I mean, you played this probably back in the day. I'm guessing. I did play this back in the day, and I hated <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> This is just, I, Mist is a fine game. It's a very atmospheric game. Uh, uh, it, it's, it drops you into this world and says, you have to find out what's going on. You have to explore it. We're giving you virtually no direction. You go figure it out. Yeah, I mean, well, the game gives you direction as you ex- learn. Right, right. You know, you learn about the different ages that are involved in the game. You learn how to manipulate time. You learn how about right. the family and stuff of the of the place right. that you're in. Right, but I'm saying that, uh, you you get direction by finding out things. Not you know, it doesn't drop you to the world and say you know, go save the king or something. It even lets you. Well, it sort of gives you the choice as to what you want, who you want to back effectively yeah. at one point, without uh, giving too much away. So back in the day, uh, it, that was just not my type of game. I was into. Twitch reflexes. I was into uh, platforming and jumping and shooting. So when I had a chance, we came back and looked at it. Now I'm a much more mature gamer than I was back then. So I sat down. I said, "I let's 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 dive into this world. Let's get lost into it. Let's see what we can come up with." I still don't like it, <laughs> and it's not Mist's fault. Okay, Mist does a really good job presenting you this world that you go and explore and you find out about and you 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 find out why it exists and and like you were saying before manipulate time and all and and uh, uh, different aspects of the island but for me uh, I and I typically enjoy those drop you in let you learn type of games but for me I was so lost in the beginning Every time I made any type of progress, I was like, okay, <coughs> now the game's going to open up to me. And it would be like one little passageway that would get me to something else that I didn't understand. I was like, yeah. And I kept, I kept waiting for that aha, now I get it moment. And I never found it. I never got, either, either I didn't get far enough to find it, uh, which is very possible, or... There isn't that moment to be had. Uh, the video clips that you watch, I don't mind them being postage stamp size. They they made it work in the story, right? Yeah. What I don't like is uh, they do this static effect because they don't want you to get the whole message type deal. I hated that. I hated it. Uh, the environments that you go on, there are times, and it's not prevalent, but it does happen, where you're at a screen and you know you're supposed to do something and you have to pixel hunt to find what it is you're supposed to do. That one magical uh, switch or that one uh, 
uh, unsuspecting panel that you click and it slides open. You're like, <clears throat> I, I'll, you know, you so you end up just kind of clicking around the screen. I hate that. I didn't think it was too bad in that department. I it, it was no, it, it I was... wasn't. But, well, here's the other thing. I would get somewhere, right? And I'd be like, I know something's supposed to happen here. And I would start clicking around, and then there would be nothing. And I'd be like, well, crap. <laughs> you know, what What have I been doing here? Why, why is this messing up? So, I will not deny Mist uh, for doing what it does. It tells... It has an interesting environment, and it opens gaming up to a uh, age group that was otherwise untapped at the time, and is still under tapped today. But for me, I don't like Mist at all. You know, it's funny because when this came out, I had the exact same feeling. I was like, "This is crap. This is style over substance." And much like your st- your other speech, I too came back to this. I'm like, I'm going to approach this with an open mind. I enjoyed it way more now than I did then. And I'll tell you why. I enjoy this from an artistic and technological angle that I didn't know about before. Okay. The, the fact that they actually could put this together was, is quite remarkable. Okay. Uh, having watched some documentary footage on this and seen what they went through, it this was not an easy game. This took a lot of guts to do. Sure. The fact, something you, that I doubt anyone knew, I didn't know it until I read it and saw the documentary, they had this whole game mapped out, and they role-played it in Dungeons & Dragons before they actually put it down. Sure. So these guys, much like your game, you've got some other old-school role players. How many games has Dungeons & Dragons spawned? All of them? Yeah, tons. A, a, a huge, a huge amount, yeah. But these guys, you know, they, they were under the pressure that people, because once Seventh Guest came out, people wanted more of that. Yes. That's what they thought this genre was going to be. And this is clearly a superior game to that. You're right, it opened the door for housewives and people that are in, that normally wouldn't play these types of games. It also, you got to think, this was the, this was the thing that shipped a million, two million, ten million CD-ROMs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right? People this are like, I got to play hardware. this. This sold you know, hardware. This thing sold like six million copies. Yeah, you know? and back in the time when six million copies was everyone. <laughs> yeah. So, but the art, I like, I appreciate this world. Yeah. I one thing I always, I will say, I always appreciate the music and the and the architecture of the world. They did a great job envisioning this world. I agree. Um, I think part of the problem with the game is the technology still wasn't there to do everything you wanted. Right, and if it is not a Twitch game, no, you know? no, no, no. So you're not going to get that kind of enjoyment out of no. it. But you know, and it, a lot of people didn't like it back in the day, and, and they were they even made a, a a mockery of the game. You remember that game, Pissed? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you any anything that's popular gains satire. Look, he remembers it, <laughs> and chat. They they satire they, much like Windows also got that treatment, if you recall, but. Going back to play this, I actually enjoyed it. Would I play it again? You know, I might. I might. If I, it's funny when you look at the solution for this game. It, there's hardly anything to the solution. Yeah, I but know. I mean, if you look at the solution, and you know what to do, you can roll through this thing quick. Yeah. But I mean, you could never do that by playing it. It's like you have to go and explore, and you do have to read those books. Yeah. You've got to look at everything. You've got to think outside the box. It works. To be completely honest. This is this is a point and click adventure <coughs> and a text adventure all rolled into one. Yeah, it w- which I guess was the style of the time. Yeah, uh, Mist contains twenty five hundred frames. That's pretty impressive. It's got like I said a full orchestral like they did everything. Oh, this, yeah, the, yeah, the music in this is is top notch. So by two thousand two or by two thousand, like I mentioned, Mist had sold more than six point three million copies, and it was only exceeded by The Sims. In 2002, as the top game of all time. Now, both those have been eclipsed by, by now. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's because the market is so much larger now. There now, are so many more people playing games. I got some reviews on this, because I thought, and I, got, I wanted to get some that were contemporary with when this release was. PC Review gave this a 90%. They said, Mist is so fresh and original that even the most jaded adventure hack will be enjoyed and enchanted by it. Uh, PC Zone gave it a 67. Oh, that seems brutal. 
It said, looking back at the criticisms that were hurled at seventh guest, it seems ironic that most of the games which have attempted to emulate it have turned out to be worst. <laughs> and so that's what they're saying Mist was. I mean, a chief imitation of seventh guest. Now, did you prefer this over seventh guest? Yo, oh, yeah. See, I didn't. Seventh I, Guest has a lot more atmosphere, but this has a lot more depth. A uh, lot more depth. I, I enjoyed the setting of Seventh <coughs> Guest more. I, I appreciate that Mist made their own world. Yeah. And Seventh Guest just kind of pulled off the horror genre. Uh, but I like that atmosphere. Let me, the murder mystery Let me explain horror to you why this is better than Seventh Guest. It's not just me that thinks that. Listen to this. So, this has been uh, made so many top 100 games. Of course. Uh, it, it's, I mean, I'm not going to go through all, there's so many. It did win best game on the Mac in 93. It was number 42 in the PC Gamer Top 50 Games of All Time. So there's that. Uh, it had it, novels, three novels published about it. Uh, it also had a comic book series. It's also got a television series, apparently, in development. Yeah. So and, and it's it, got tons of action. And it had multiple, multiple sequels, including oh God, an online yeah. game. Uh, it's ridiculous, yeah. Unlike your game, this game you can buy for no money. There's tons of them. There's tons and tons of these available. You can get it for three or four bucks. Yeah, you, you can buy this. You can buy the remastered <coughs> uh, version of this game on Steam for six bucks right now. I will say, if I'll, this I, is your type of game, man, go do it. I looked at some of these uh, like modernized versions and remastered and re. They've got all, deluxe or whatever. Yeah, you do want to go with one of those. Yeah, the the amount of hassle it took me to even come close to getting this to run emulated was really tough. Thankfully, I had a, a PC that would run it. And even on that PC, I had Windows 98. So I had to install Windows 311 on there just so I could run it, which was a pain in the butt. Well, and Very the good. enhanced versions do... Uh, clean, They're enhanced. They clean up the graphics a lot. and they, they Instead of just clicking a scene by scene, you get more of a, a fluid movement. Um, you know, also the only... Uh, abandonware version of this, Aaron, is the Mac version. The Mac version you can download for free if you own a Mac and play it. And uh, all of the other PC versions and whatnot uh, are not. You know what? You reminded me of something. This was also sort of released on the Amiga. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to run on your stock 500. Some assembly required. But they. Uh, <laughs> I recall this being... An, uh, there, an Amiga port, and Wiki confirmed that when I was just looking this over. So if you if you have something to run it, there you go. I'm assuming you'd have to have something with a CD-ROM. So there you go. You know what else has fluid motion? Me? Aside from, you took my bit. <laughs> just get the <laughs> wheel out, you idiot. Oh, okay. What, tell the people what you added this week. This week, we added, uh, for the Retro Rewind, we've got Auric computers coming back around. And Orc. for the uh, new piece of the week, we've got food games. Food games. Food. Who suggested that one, Brent? Uh, someone very hungry. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer. There we go. Oh, look, look at, at us. Yeah. That. That's crazy. Let's leave it here for a second. Oh my gosh. What'd you get? We've got the first orig uh, the the first retro rewind. We're taking another look at Auric Computers. Oh. <laughs> You're kidding me. Nope, there it is. <laughs> okay, there we go. Now, do you remember when we put on the Auric the last time? Nope. <laughs> Tell the people about your merch while I look it up. Uh, real quick, guys. I finally... <laughs> Here we go. Let, Get ready. Buckle in. Let, let me tell you a little story about me. Uh, <laughs> I am really bad about <coughs> designing... Or coming up with something, and when the time comes to kind of present it to someone or show it to someone, I don't, and I end up just ditching it. Uh, this is true for me with board games, card games. Uh, I've designed multiple postcards and uh, different uh, 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 merchandise in the past for our show and some of the other ones, and I've always just said, you know what, I don't want to put this out there for whatever reason. Well, that's done. I am just throwing the merchandise out there as I complete it. Um, You're an artistic it, coward. It, I, I sort of am. It is currently being reviewed uh, <coughs> for our storefront. It has to go through a review process to make sure it's not obscene or copyright and stuff like that. As soon as 
it gets approved. I'm going to link it up. Hopefully, it'll be done by next week. And if, then at that point, if you want to go buy the merchandise, you can. Uh, if not, that's fine, too. So, no. so you <coughs> demand it. You no. will go buy it. Uh, and we're putting out there things that, that we haven't done before. We've got, we're going to have magnets and keychains, and we're going to have um, uh, 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 coasters and uh, puzzles and shirts. And it's going to be a whole... Tennis rackets, bongs, it's everything. Gonna be, it's going to be uh, some a slew of things that you may or may not be interested in. I tried to pick items that kind of made sense, that you just have kind of sitting around that look nice, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah there's the show, and remember that kind of stuff. So hopefully next week, if all that gets approved, uh, we'll be making the big announcement on the show. Also, in our continuing merch big announcement <laughs> marathon, the Thursday or Thursday March is the big amount, the big merch. Uh, wow! You know I'm what? Glad I just... you got the spokesman for this merch. <laughs> no, but come on, Marvel mouth, spit it out. Oh, bro, bro. Uh, also, I want to thank Anchor.fm for hosting all of our podcasts. Uh, you can check us out on Anchor FM as our single entity show, or of course tie into the entire Amigos family of shows. Uh, we do it both ways for this show because we're, we're, we're different. We're, we're not like all the other shows. Actually, all the other shows are like that. <laughs> that's, that's not true. Yeah, they are. No. Yeah, they no. get individual feeds. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. No, they don't. Okay. I don't think so. I know. In fact, I know so. Uh, anyway, I uh, also want to thank... John Boat of Car Schaller for being our own our one and only Anchor.fm supporter. And if you want to join him and get a shout out at the end of all of our shows, maybe I'll do something fun. I want to <coughs> sing. Maybe I'll Morris coded or something. Uh, you can go to Anchor.fm slash ARG percent and uh, join us on there. Anything that's done through that uh, helps just this show. So if you want to just sort uh, support ARG, you can do it that way. Aaron, any other announcements before we wrap it up? No, man. I did look up what we did on the ORC last time. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is going to be a tough one. What? We, last time we did the ORC, it was Doggy and Zargon's Revenge. Oh, Doggy was great. Well, there ain't no more Doggy on there, pal. <laughs> uh, also, I do want to thank Buck Owen for uh, uh, subscribing to Twitch during the stream. That was awful kind of you, sir. Thank you, Six Buck. months. That, that's support, man. That's Buck support. Owen, gaming, gaming legend on the Coco. Uh, we also want to thank Duncan Styles for our awesome background. That's right. And Bark Bit for our cool ending theme. Yes, I love Let's it. Let's say hi to some of the people in chat here. We've got L. Curtis Boyle, another Coco luminary, dedicated, lurking 9 to 5. Lurking 9 to 5. Um, we've got De La Morte, Picard in the house, Amiga Bang in the house. We got uh, Bitstorm. That's a cool name. Frodo NL. I think he was first in today. We had a good. We had a good lineup today. Am I missing? Did I miss anybody here? Oh, Silver Streak in the house. The Dunk. All of our favorites. Jack. So thank you very much, Terror K. Tons of good people in today. We appreciate you. I do apologize for my hideous voice as it dies. I gave it everything I got, Brent, but all this talking is yeah. tough on me. Given all you got, it's like ten percent of everyone else. So we'll have to accept it. <laughs> Blech. So All right, folks. Next week, Auric. Get your Auric back yep. out, y'all. Until then, flame what? off. Windows. What does that mean? Windows.